We're so back. We're so back. I can't believe Nick allowed me back on this thing. It's been far too long, but I'm appreciative. I hope to not squander this opportunity. But let's not harp on that. Let's harp on this new setup. New camera. Thank you, Nick. This thing is way too high quality for me. Thank you for the lighting. It's very bright. My right eye is being tortured right now. And this wall. <sighs> Got to put something on there. Got to spice it up a little bit. But then again, the last time I had a setup, it was in college and there was a lofted bed in the back. And you guys called me bunk bed breakdowns because of that. So maybe I shouldn't have anything in the back. You're going to call me like Gray Wall Noah. And I'll run with that too. Listen, if you want to give this show a name, go for it. Because it is currently unnamed and unloved. And I hope that changes after today. Because today, we're talking about some old guys. Everybody wants to talk Young Guns and Dynasty. You want to hit that R. Kelly vibe where you're talking about the youngins with potential. Not me. I'm focusing on older players, at least this week, that I think are undervalued in Dynasty. Players that you can get on the cheap because they are old. Because nobody thinks that they have much left in the tank. You can get a second round pick. Flip it for a guy who might win you a championship just because, hey, he's a little bit older than people want to admit can still produce for your Dynasty teams. So without further ado, if there's an intro, let's hit it. If there's not, let's just get straight to it. Brandon Cooks. I'm a dumb man, but I'm not dumb enough to start this series with a player who I don't know is going to go for 1,000 yards and 6 touchdowns next season. Listen, nobody wants Brandon Cooks. The Houston Texans barely want Brandon Cooks. The Los Angeles Rams didn't really want him. The Saints didn't want him. The Pats didn't want him. And hell, I didn't want him in Dynasty either. I tried to shop him last offseason. Nobody was buying. But now I am. It kind of sucks, though, because he's still on my fucking roster. Listen, he's 28 years old. People are going to say he's old. He's past his prime. True, he has past his prime. But his prime was, what, 25, 26? And yet, these past two years, he's been nothing but a wide receiver, too, for you. Despite playing with Deshaun Watson, he's good. Not a good guy. Good quarterback. And then Tyrod Taylor, who the Chargers, shout out the worst team in the fucking league, decided to stab him in the chest instead of paying him and playing him on the field every Sunday. It allowed Herbert to get out there, which I'm not complaining about. But listen, Tyrod Taylor fucking stinks. He's a joke of a quarterback. And to go along with that, they got that long neck bastard David Mills throwing or Davis Mills throwing him the ball. He was in a shit situation. He was the only wide receiver on the team with over 453 yards. He was the leading yard getter by a wide margin on that team. He had nothing to help him out. He was the only one out there running around. And most of the time it was just for cardio because Davis Mills can't hit a fucking broadside of a barn with a horseshoe. This dude stunk. But Brandon Cooks was still out there going for 1K like clockwork. And listen, although he's old, although he's injury prone, you can't even see. I don't even know where my camera's at. I'm going to have to go like this now. Injury prone. He's only missed more than one game once since his rookie year and that was the year that he got concussed like two times in three weeks that's just tough for him that's tough luck he's missed one game each of the past two years i'm not going to call the guy injury prone i'm going to call him really unlucky and listen although he is in a shit situation although it doesn't look bright for his future because he's in an incompetent situation with an incompetent franchise we have to take into consideration what his contract looks like what his situation looks like and what all that means for Dynasty. So he's 28 years old on a roster that is trying to get younger, looking to ship off pieces, especially because they have a new regime in there. And whatever was going on in the last one was not good. Bill O'Brien, whatever the fuck the, quote, the guy this past year was, David Culley, who did way better than anybody expected, they canned his ass despite winning probably 18 more games than anybody thought he would. It's really shitty there. And the fact that they're super young and the fact that they don't have all that much money, they're 15th in cap space this year and Brandon Cooks is a $16 million cap hit. Why wouldn't a team who is trying to contend, who needs a wide receiver too, like the Chargers with Mike Williams becoming a free agent, like Green Bay with Marquez Valdez-Scantling basically just running on a treadmill all game, why wouldn't the Bills, who I guess had Gabriel Davis, who's like the best receiver in the league now, but a team like that, looking at the Rams who are in the Super Bowl this year, and say, hey, we can probably ship a second or third round pick to this garbage franchise for a wide receiver like Brandon Cooks who's going to add another element to our offense. Sure, that's best case scenario, but it could be a realistic one. Because if I'm Brandon Cooks, 
I do not want to be in Houston. If I'm Houston, I do not want Brandon Cooks because he's taking up a lot of money and he doesn't really align with the window of our team. I don't really think the Houston Texans have a winning window given what they have right now. But a 28-year-old receiver who's eating up a lot of money and is going to be a free agent next year and is definitely not coming back and is definitely not going to take a team-friendly deal to help them in the future, I don't know why they wouldn't ship him off for what they can get out of him this offseason. So if he does land in a team like Green Bay or L.A. or Buffalo or any of these teams that have a competent quarterback, we'll see with Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, but a team with a competent quarterback who needs a solid wide receiver two or a 1B in their offense, all he's ever done is proven that he is that. In his last seven seasons, he's posted over a 1,000 yards in six of them. He's Mr. Consistent. He's Amari Cooper without the flash, without the glimmer, without any of that. He's put up 11.7 PPR fantasy or half PPR fantasy points per game in six of those seven seasons. The only year he missed it was that year in L.A. where his head got jumbled up every other hit. And listen, looking back to this past season in a situation where there was no supporting cast in a situation where their wide receiver two is nico fucking collins he was still a wide receiver one in 25 percent of his games it's not easy to go out there when the defense knows you're the only bum that can catch the ball and put up 20 fantasy points in more than four outings and that's just what he did four times out of his 16 games he was a wide receiver one on the week and he was a wide receiver two in 63 percent of his games last year I'm not saying he's a league winner. I'm not saying he's going to completely flip your roster around. But if you're starting 10 guys, you have like three or four flexes. He's the perfect flex option for the next year, maybe next two years, maybe next three years, because all he's ever done is be a wide receiver two for you. If you bought him last offseason, listen, you got another wide receiver two season out of the guy. If you buy him this offseason, you're probably going to get a few more as well. Even though people might want to say that he's washed, he was still wide receiver 14 in yards per route run, which... A lot of people point to as a stat to define who good receivers are. And even if you think that it might be a skewed stat in favor of Brandon Cooks that I cherry picked, listen to the only receivers above him and slightly below him. Number one is Cooper Cup. Number two is Deontay Harris. So maybe I did cherry pick it. Number three, Devontae Adams, then Debo, then Antonio Brown, then Justin Jefferson, A.J. Brown, Jamar Chase, Tyler Lockett, T. Higgins, Tyreek Hill, C.D. Lamb, Russell Gage, Brandon Cooks, Stephon Diggs, and Devonta Smith. There's only like two names of guys on there who you wouldn't consider top 24 dynasty wide receivers, one of them being Russell Gage, the other being Deontay Harris, and then a fringy guy might be Tyler Lockett. But listen, if you can get him, if you can get Brandon Cooks for the price of Tyler Lockett, a little bit less than Tyler Lockett, I'd go for it because other than touchdowns, they're very similar receivers. The only thing in Tyler Lockett's favor right now is the certainty of his situation. But we don't even know if Russ is going back to Seattle. So I'm not so sure that Brandon Cooks is any worse of an option in Dynasty than a guy like Tyler Lockett. And because of that, I'm all in on him. And it just comes down to the risk-reward profile or ratio or however you want to call it and whatever my fucking business professors told me about in college. The worst-case scenario, and I'm not going to say I'm going to bank on injuries and say worst case is he gets hurt and he never plays again because you can say that for fucking anybody. But the most realistic worst case scenario is, hey, he stays in Houston this year. He puts up like 850 yards because that team is incompetent. He goes into the offseason with not much of a market and he lands in a pretty shitty situation like a Miami or something like that. And nobody's really inspired about him. And the second round pick you paid for him maybe becomes a third round pick the year after. You lose a little ROI. Best case scenario is what I laid out earlier. He goes to Green Bay. He goes to L.A. He goes to Buffalo. He goes even to a a team like the Patriots again, where he can be that number one option on that team. Hell, he was the number one option on a team like this this year in Houston. I think because of that, him landing in a situation other than Houston a year earlier than a lot of people are expecting because next year is when he's a free agent. If he hits the open market by way of trading this offseason and he finds himself in a new home, I think his value is only going to shoot upwards if he produces in a new home with a good situation and he resigns to that team, then the sky's the limit for him. And listen, the sky's probably like a very back end first or a very high end second, but that's all it takes for you to get a really high ROI. And if you want to play the game as moving chips around and hoping to return a lot of assets on one single investment and you want to trade like the 207 to get Brandon Cooks and then next offseason you trade Brandon Cooks away for like the 201 but Brandon Cooks helped you win your dynasty championship, then so be it. I think he can be that guy for you because that's all he's ever been for me. I love you, Brandon. And secondly, we're going to talk about another guy who's only ever been there for me, Melvin fucking Gordon. I don't like him. 
Never have, never will. That's a lie. He was the first jersey I ever got, and he promptly got moved because he sat out and brand and and I, I cut this shit out. I just get a little emotional when Melvin Gordon is the topic of conversation. I can't even speak. We're going to talk about Melvin Gordon, another guy who has been there for me most of my life until he acted like he was better than four years for $40 million, turned it down, sat out, realized that bald-headed fuck Austin Eckler is better than him, and then got two for 16 in Denver. I'm not a huge fan of Melvin Gordon, but it's hard to deny that he's good for fantasy football. For Dynasty, it's debatable because he's going to be 29 next year, and 29 for a running back might as well be 109. He might die on the field. It might end up being a catastrophic situation, God forbid, for Melvin Gordon. But if he's out there and he's healthy, shit could look good for him. Listen, 29 is no spring chicken. It is not a spry age, but it's hard to say he's been injury prone. I know that's been a knock on him or it was a knock on him when he was in L.A., when he was in San Diego. But he really hasn't missed all too many games because of injury, right? He hasn't missed more than one game because of injury since 2018. And I will go to my grave saying that injury was the dumbest fucking play call I've ever seen. I still remember it. Not the week, probably like week 13, but it was against the Cardinals. They ran like a double end around. (laughs) He got it on like a swing pass and his knee just, whatever, like exploded. That sucked because he was doing really well that year. And then the year after he missed four games because, again, like I said before, he thought he should have got a lot more money than he could have. The market wasn't like looking too hot for him his agent was a little bit fraudulent regardless we're not going to talk about his prior contract we're going to talk about what he can potentially get in the future because yes he is an unrestricted free agent this offseason and yes he does have a a tread on his tires but if he isn't going to be hurt which we never want to bank on injuries it's hard to not bank on injuries when you're like a 29 year old running back but if he's as healthy as he has been these last few seasons I think Melvin Gordon could be in store for a fringy RB1 year and for the price you're gonna have to pay for him There aren't many guys that you can, with how confident I am, you can nearly guarantee a high-end RB2, low-end RB1 season for that you can pay a low-end second-round pick for. Or like a fucking, a young receiver who people think is still good at football and flip that for a guy who can give you one, maybe two years of fantasy viability in your RB slot. Like a Gabriel Davis for, you can probably do Gabriel Davis and Melvin Gordon plus like a second or you can do like LaVisca Chenault and a third for Melvin Gordon I'd be perfectly fine with that because when you look at what this guy has done right past three years point per game basis RB20 RB20 RB14 it's nothing to blow you away but when you take into consideration the context Javante Williams was picked in what the second round last year on a pretty shitty team in Denver and the fact that Melvin Gordon could still be a middling RB2 despite a high draft capital running back coming in there with the talent that Javante had speaks volumes the year prior his first year in denver with an absolute shithole of an offense led by drew lock he still went in there and he produced to the tune of an rb20 finish and the year prior was when he missed those four games austin eckler was looking way too good for melvin gordon to keep sitting out melvin gordon went out on the field and he was still a fringe rb1 he had a really good year and he's been nothing but a picture of consistency even this past year, and dating back to his rookie year, the year where he scored zero touchdowns. From there on out, he put up 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns in every single season, except the year where he sat out the four games in 2019. But even with that, his pace was well beyond 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns. And I'm not going to write off that pace because, listen, he wasn't hurt. He just didn't end up playing football because he thought he should have gotten a lot more money. And we can say he's washed, right? We can say that he is over the hill. But he was still 28 this year, and being 28 in a not-so-great offensive situation, he still looked really good. He was 11th in juke rate, and he had the 7th most broken tackles, so he was still shifting guys around out there, and he was making them fucking scrape the grass and turf and everything. They were busting their ankles wide open. He was breaking off some runs, and if we want to talk about how good Javante Williams was, listen, Melvin Gordon only had 5 less broken tackles than the guy. And if Javante Williams is as good as everybody says Javante Williams is, and he's creeped up the board to the RB2 in Dynasty in some situations, in some contexts, in some formats, he is a top five running back, almost on consensus when it comes to Dynasty. Is he, If he is as good and if he is as talented as everybody is saying that he is, then what does it say about Melvin Gordon's talent that this guy who is a top five talent in the league couldn't beat out a 28-year-old running back on his roster? It's not like Denver had some sort of crazy allegiance to Melvin Gordon. He was getting $8 million a year on the last year of his deal. 
whereas they just sunk second round draft capital into a guy like Javante Williams who had young legs. If Javante Williams with as much talent as he had couldn't usurp Melvin Gordon even halfway through the season, all it tells me combined with the numbers like his juke rate and his broken tackles is that Melvin Gordon still has juice left in the tank and there aren't many options in free agency where a team can get a player on a team-friendly deal because he is older and he doesn't have that leverage to go out there, break a bunch of tackles, carry the ball a lot, and have the ability to pass block and catch passes out of the backfield. I don't know how I set up that sentence, so I don't know how to grammatically end it, but I'm just saying Melvin Gordon can do all that shit. And if we look at teams like Buffalo or the Cardinals or the Chiefs, teams that are obviously either missing or going to miss a portion of their run game, like Buffalo, sure, Devin Singletary looked good towards the end of the year. Zach Moss absolutely fucking stinks. But if they could add Melvin Gordon to that backfield, that offense would be incredible, and that would just be a luxury to them. The Cardinals, they brought in James Conner. If Melvin Gordon is like James Conner 2.0, Tell me you wouldn't be happy with that. People were paying, and by people, I mean me, second-round picks for James Conner, a second-round pick for James Conner mid-season. You can probably pay a second-round pick for Melvin Gordon right now and then mid-season flip him for more than that when people start to realize how valuable he is. Nobody was really saying that James Conner was going to have that much value beyond this season because he was on a one-year deal in Arizona, yet people were still paying the big bucks for guys like him and Leonard Fournette because they were bringing so much value in season and helping you with that playoff push and then both happen to get injured so if he lands on those teams if he lands on division rival chiefs if he wants to stay in the afc west and be a guy who can catch passes out of the backfield and just basically be like 200 percent better than what daryl williams ever was and a million times better than ceh ever was and whatever the fuck Jarek mckinnon was doing in the playoffs that would be incredible for not only melvin gordon but the teams that go out and acquire him so listen i'm gonna go back to what i said for Brandon Cooks, best case scenario, I laid it out. He goes to Buffalo, he goes to Arizona, he goes to the Chiefs. Fringe RB1, if you want to, you can sell him midseason, or it's just a guy that you can pay a mid to low end second right now and hopefully help you for that playoff push because he ends up in a really good situation and is a fringe RB1 for you next year and maybe a little bit fantasy viable the year year after. I'm not going to be unrealistic and say that he has a lot left in the tank just because of his age. But I'm going to say that you should go out there and send a mid to late second round pick if you can or one of those young receivers to get a guy with that sort of upside. And I think worst case scenario is he gets re-signed to Denver but just has the same role that Javante Williams had last year. He plays the 1B to Javante's 1A. And even with that, right, he put up 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns this year. Probably going to go down a bit. But a late second round pick for a guy who's probably still going to put up like 800 to 900 total yards, 30 to 40 catches and almost double-digit touchdowns, I don't hate that. I don't hate that one bit. And I'm going to end this video with a bold claim, a bold take, something that's unfounded that like 12 months from now, you guys can't even say that I'm wrong because there's nothing to base it off of. But I'm just going to say this. I think Javante Williams has a more fragile dynasty value than Melvin Gordon. Let me just explain. If Melvin Gordon gets re-signed to Denver for more than one year, Javante Williams goes from the consensus RB2 to like maybe RB10 because people are just banking on Melvin Gordon going. Melvin Gordon's value, I don't even know what he is. I'd guess RB37. Ike, listen, I'm going to give you one thing this video. Just put it right here, what Melvin Gordon's dynasty ADP is right now. I would say Melvin Gordon's like RB37. If he re-signs in Denver, probably still RB37. If he goes elsewhere, probably like RB23, but it just shows that he's a little less fragile than Javante Williams. If I had to pay the price for Javante Williams or take the L on buying a guy like Melvin Gordon, give me Melvin 11 times out of 10. That's going to do it for today. If I should buy a tripod for this camera, let me know. If I should find out how to make this light not flash my eyes, I think it can go brighter. Oh, shit. Okay, I'm not doing this anymore. That I'm blinded. If I should get a better setup, if I should put something on the walls, let me know. If there's something I can improve on, let me know. There's definitely a ton. But I just want to genuinely say thank you. Uh, I appreciate you guys making it this far. If you did make it this far, I love doing this. And I'm really happy to be doing it again. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nick. And I'll see you hopefully next time if it went well. Peace.